Okay, a wonderful good morning here in Frankfurt. A wonderful good morning, dear online audience. This is the first time that the Financial Center Breakfast, formerly known as Food for Thought, um, is a hybrid event. So we are very excited. We are here at uh, Refinitiv today. Um, a member of Frankfurt Mind Finance uh, who provided us with the location and also with our wonderful speaker, which I will present to you um, a little later. I'm happy that you made your way here to um, this location in Frankfurt, as well as that I'm very happy uh, you are joining um, from home, from your home office. I think we have a very interesting topic today. And um, normally uh, people joining here are usually, uh, usually guests, uh, regular guests of the Frankfurt Mind Finance events. So um, I welcome here uh, you you here uh, at this at this point. Um, so uh, still, I have to I have to add that we ask for your indulgence if the technology is not yet one hundred percent, and we will improve constantly. As the forty four events before today's food for thought is organized in cooperation with the organization of foreign banks in Germany. So always a big thanks to our partner. I would also, as I briefly did, express my very special thanks to Refinitiv and René Kühne, um, who are supporting today's event as a host and um, by providing us the speaker. What is the topic of today's session? Fighting financial crime and combating money laundering are the top priorities for the EU and Germany as money laundering undermines the integrity of the financial system, can lead to the financing of ter terrorism and other criminal activities and poses a serious risk to global economic stability. The P European Union has proposed the establishment of the Anti-Money Laundering Authority, we call it AMLA, to coordinate the efforts of all member states. As many of you know, Frankfurt has applied for the seed of the AMLA, and there are several reasons why Frankfurt is a good choice for the seed of AMLA. And I would be a fool not to use this um, situation and uh, to do a little bit of advertising. So sorry for, for, sorry for this. Um, first, Germany is a major global financial center, and Frankfurt is its financial capital. Second, Frankfurt has a unique ecosystem of supervisory knowledge and infrastructure as it is, among others, home to the ECB, the SSM, BaFin and IOPA, making it the ideal location for the AMLA to coordinate its efforts. Third, Frankfurt is an open and transparent financial hub. And fourth, Frankfurt is located in the heart of Europe with the world at its doorstep. So let's take a closer look at the EU regulations and law enforcement priorities when it comes to financial crime and money laundering. Today, our esteemed speaker is Chi Sedanius, Global Head of Financial Crime and Industry Affairs here at Refinitiv, and at the same time, Chair of the Europe Chapter Coalition to Fight Financial Crime. Welcome. Thank you. Good to have you Thank here. You. His role is to identify regulatory changes and lead programs of action with the sole purpose of enhancing the fight against financial crime more effective and delivering the best possible outcome for the industry. Together with the World Economic Forum and Europol, he's the founder of the Global Coalition to Fight Financial Crime and co-chair of the B20's Integrity and Compliance Task Force. Dear online audience, Please feel free to input your questions during or after the speech in the Q&A section of our Zoom system. And for the audience here, we will have a discussion afterwards, and I hope it's, it's going to be lively, and I'm looking forward to having questions from your side. Um, so much for the uh, opening words, and um, yeah, Che, welcome. The stage is yours now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So thanks for that kind introduction. It's wonderful to be here in Frankfurt. I'm based in London. Um, so, so that's where I spend quite a bit of time when I'm not uh, flying around uh, in different parts of the world. I uh, just came back from South Africa, which I highly recommend during this time of the year. 
uh, especially being in London where we've seen a very similar weather actually. But, but anyways, it's, it's lovely to be here. So what I thought I'd do today is jump around in a number of different topics, but particularly regarding sort of regulatory changes. Um, I'm not sure if we have the, uh, the presentation up. It should be connected. But I'm not sure if it's uh, if actually if it's coming through. <clears throat> I don't know if there's a. Uh... So hopefully we'll get that sorted in a in a moment. Yeah, okay. there we go. Lovely. Um, so what I thought I'd do is really give you a picture in terms of what's happening on the on the global stage related to uh, AML. What I'm going to do is is paint a picture that AML has evolved away just from um, acronyms like money laundering and terrorism financing, but the whole perspective of the impact of it and who's involved in the implications that it's well beyond just laundering proceeds, but actually impacts the environment uh, and a lot of other social issues that, that are incredibly important. So I'll give you a flavor for, for how that's being reflected globally and also within, within Europe itself. Uh, and then also talk about uh, what we're doing uh, as a company in terms of engaging with both regulators and, and policymakers, including law enforcement, uh, in terms of ensuring that they have the tools and they have the you know the best systems uh, and, and resources available to them in terms of how they prioritize uh, some of their some of the key focus areas. I'll I'll share with you those discussions as well. But just to set the scene a bit, so, um, so as, as was referenced, I had the pleasure of being one of the co-chairs of the B20's Integrity and, uh, Compliance Task Force. The B20 is the, the industry version of the G20, uh, who give advice to, to, to the governments. Uh, and clearly, in, in its published report, the Indonesian hosted the presidency last year, India is the presidency uh, this year. Uh, and what came up loud and clear was that there's a number of key priorities from the business areas that they wanted to uh, advise and, and make sure that the governments prioritize as well. One of those is clearly on, on, on cryptos and digital assets um, in terms of the potential risks that that, that industry poses, not just from a national security perspective in terms of sanctions evasion, but fraud and, and a lot of other uh, issues. So that's clearly a, a topic that's, that's top of mind for many. Uh, the other issue, uh, which I, I'm particularly sort of pleased about is the focus on environmental crime. Uh, and that's an issue that, and a topic that we have been promoting and trying to raise awareness of for the last couple of years. We, we've termed uh, environmental crime green crime, which is essentially the recognition that sustainability and financial crime are interlinked. Illegal logging, illegal fishing, illegal mining is very much tied to biodiversity loss and all the rest of it. So, so uh, the G20 thankfully also put that on, on, on top of their agenda as well, which is, which is good to see. A big uh, topic of ours that we've promoted as well is, is collaboration between the public and the private sector. Very simple concept, but really has been done very well for, for many, many, many years. And so certainly within the European context, but also global context, there's a number of uh, what's called public-private partnerships. Uh, information sharing partnerships, which is akin to the Joint Money Laundering Task Force in the UK, and I know Germany has their own, uh, and there's many uh, variations of those, um, of those consortiums. And essentially what they are, as you may know, is a, a partnership model where the regulators, the law enforcement, the banking community share intelligence with each other. Now, it sounds very simple, but it's actually quite complex legally, because it sometimes has been done. Uh, sometimes there isn't even a regulatory statute that says that, that it can be done. And there's all types of models as well. There's a Singapore model, but they don't really share uh, individual information, but it's more typologies. You know, what does child trafficking look like? Um, uh, all the way to the Australia model, where actually they bring in resources from the banking sector and in effect they become employees of the financial intelligence unit and get very detailed information in terms of uh, some of the information. So there's all kinds of business models, but in, in principle, this is something that we as a firm uh, and, and the industry has promoted quite heavily. So I'll get into that. So we're very pleased that the European Commission in, has in fact adopted in the AML legislative package, specific references and trying to promote that. So I'll get into that a little bit. But anyways, going to the G20. So there's very much similar themes uh, at, the, at the international level. I'll talk about Interpol. This is interesting for me. So they are about to celebrate their 100th anniversary this year. They're also trying to adapt 
to the new future. Anyone who's dealt with law enforcement is one of the most conservative groups you can ever think that they don't like to change at all. Right? So say, so look, we've done this for 100 years. There's no reason why we should do any, anything different. But even within Interpol, there's a debate that they themselves need to modernize in terms of their approach. They themselves have recognized that they need to understand, well, you know what, maybe there's other parties in the system that we can leverage and that we can, that we can partner with. So the reason why I bring this up, the New Delhi, so they have a general assembly every year. Last year, it was in, in, in the, India. And uh, uh, myself and Huli Sila, who is the chair of the Egmont Group, which is the FI, the international organization that coordinates well all the FIUs globally, were invited to make the case that Interpol needs to pass a resolution. They have to pass a resolution to do anything different, to pass a resolution to say, yes, we are willing to expand our ability to cooperate with other parties outside of law enforcement. And it passed about 99.1%, historic. So now what we're doing, okay, what does that mean in practice? Right, so we're, we're doing a, a number of workshops to both the, F, the Egmont group is working with Interpol in terms of how FIUs, punishment intelligence units, and law enforcement can cooperate uh, from, from an operational perspective. And, and we are also uh, working with them to ensure that they understand the types of tools and the data that's out there. That's not just within the public realm, or certainly within the public sector realm, but also in the, in the private sector realm to make sure that they have the best tools avail, available to them. So there's a lot of work that's gonna be done. So hopefully, knock on wood, the next General Assembly, which will be in Vienna, uh, will be able to showcase, and we're working on some very specific cases at the moment, uh, to showcase that this works, that this, that this works. FATF, uh, you, you, I'm sure they're very busy, as you can tell, uh, the new president, or that's not new anymore, uh, Mr. Kumar, are very dedicated to issues like asset recovery and, and public registry reform, uh, all the right topics that we think uh, need to be addressed. And, and it does, uh, and I'll talk about the global coalition uh, in, in, a, in a moment as well. And of course we have the uh, European Union's AML legislative package, which you probably know is the, the, as far as I'm concerned, is the most comprehensive AML package that I've seen since AML one in 1991, for very good reason. And we'll talk about those. We'll talk about what I, you know, what we think of those. And yeah, so part of the global coalition. So I'm the, not just the founder, but I'm the chair of the Europe chapter. So the global, uh, uh, the global chair is John Cusack, who used to be uh, the chair of the uh, Wolfsburg Group. So he's our global chair. But I lead our uh, work that we're doing within Europe, which means that we interface quite a bit with the European members of the European Parliament, European Commission. Um, and many other kind of stakeholders to at least provide a platform for them to hear industry-wide view, by the way, not just within the banks, but also the corporates and many others, for us to provide a platform, for us to discuss what we think works, and what we think doesn't, because we think that a more informed policymaker makes better policy, as simple as that. Um, so we'll, 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 I'll share some views uh, on that. And just to take a step back, before we get into the uh, you know, legislative pieces and, and, uh, and the various art articles and this and that, it's good for me to step back a bit and that there's a fundamental shift that AML, CFT gets caught in acronyms are quite lifeless. It's usually, well, it's about policies and procedures and do you have a compliance officers, blah, blah, blah. And it's not. Actually, I think the whole the, the mind uh, shift, it's, it's not just about compliance anymore. These are human issues, actually. You probably know that modern day slavery or slavery today is more prevalent than when slavery was legal. Uh, and there's, of course, there's a human trafficking uh, legislation and a supply chain legislation, by the way, which also connects with it. So, so there's a lot more focus on this issue in particular. Uh, as an example, in fact, one of the things that we did in South Africa was to work with the FIU and the, and the prosecutor's office, and we just published a report, actually, we'll make sure that that's available. First time that's ever been done, where we, uh, together with the banking industry, the corporate sector, financial intelligence units, focused on the typologies and what it looks like, uh, modern-day slavery in South Africa specifically, which we just published last week uh, on, on Friday. 
um, uh, and so I think there's a lot there that we can do collectively to actually point to where where are these issues? Who you know? What are the types of typologies? What are the types of sort of patterns that we can see that can inform uh, all of us in terms of dealing with that issue? That's one example. Financial stability, um, and this is again recognized by by many countries around the world that financial crime or AML is not just a compliance issue. Ask uh, Latvia, ask Denmark. Uh, when you had ABLV, who was a, uh, deemed to be an institutional money launder by the US Treasury, they removed access to their uh, dollar funding market. ECB removed their payments from their payment system and they were gone within days. And it was a classic flight uh, um, liquidity flight as well. That's the first point. The second point, where did that money go? It went somewhere. It went to London, Frankfurt, Switzerland, Malta. So the point thing is that we can't look at money laundering as just a small little issue, but actually it, it moves quickly. So a low risk jurisdiction cannot become high risk. So I think we have to view it that way. Uh, and, I, and I reflect on my own uh, career back in the New York Fed during the financial crisis, uh, where our our concept of financial stability had to change, that it wasn't just about looking at individual institution, but looking at the network itself. And we only have to see now with the, the issue of the bank uh, in the US with, uh, with, the, with, the, with the tech sector, right? This is the same playbook. Well, my, I guess my point is money laundering is not gonna have the same impact as, as, a, as a liquidity crisis, but it's the same thing. And if we want to tackle the issue, then we have to look at it from a very different perspective than we've done in the past. I talked about green crime. Um, we had a big focus on this a couple of years ago. We launched a green crime campaign in Davos about three years ago. It's hard to, hard to keep up anymore. But the, the point being is that we, we can't look at ESG and money laundering as like two separate buckets. They're very much connected. The E has to do with environmental crime. The S has to do with social issues. Um, and so you, you, you have to, they're used for different use cases and different purposes, but they're very much connected in terms of the types of impact that we have. So, and we're, we're you know, delighted that FATF released a report on environmental crime, I think a year after we, we came out with our campaign, the G7, I think, released a, um, a statement on this issue. So, so that momentum is not going to go uh, anywhere. And I think there'll be a lot more focus on that uh, going forward as well. Right. So, <clears throat> So I guess this is a laundry list of key themes, not just in Europe, but globally. Big emphasis on collaboration and public-private partnerships, both from a political legislative level in terms of if it doesn't, if the legislation isn't there, then we need to put it there, all the way to an operational level, which is how do we find a way for you know, for, for private, the private sector and the public sector to collaborate in a much more effective way and, 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 and do different focus topics. And this pragmatically uh, uh, comes into, for instance, joint case management teams, which we're working with Interpol at the moment. So in other words, you bring the researchers, we have researchers, we have 600 of them globally. So you bring researchers from the community and you say, okay, what does child exploitation look like? Where, where, you know, where, the, where do criminals operate? Which mechanisms do them use? What are the types of typologies and transactional behavior? Uh, and that you then can socialize, as an example, uh, but there's many other uh, examples as well. I'll talk about sanctions in a minute, because that's here to stay, as, as we probably all know. It's gonna get uh, a lot more focus on that. Beneficial owner transparency, another big topic that we're trying to promote to make sure that there's as much information on public registries as possible and as accessible as, as accessible as possible. You probably all know about the European Court of Justice ruling, which is limited actually in terms of all they're saying. So European Court of Justice ruled that the general public should not have unfettered access to public registries, full stop. No problem with that. What's happened, however, is that jurisdictions have taken advantage of that and shut them down totally. That is very dangerous. Because we walk down that path, then Europe can be a gold, you know, golden years for Europe if you're a criminal. Because all you have to do is 
buy a piece of property in Portugal, get a golden visa. Happy days, right? Uh, create a shell company. Happy days. So Europe needs to be careful uh, in terms of that. Crypto assets, I'm not going to get into that, but there's a lot of focus on this, clearly. Uh, I, I don't have a view one way. I'm pretty tech neutral when it comes to cryptos. My only observations, because I dealt with these guys, because so via the coalition, we started a digital asset task force last year, July, we launched it, uh, which brought together US Treasury, some of the big crypto companies, Binance, Crypto.com, Pataf was there, et cetera, et cetera. So I ask, okay, how do we kind of get together and separate fact from fiction and produce more light rather than heat? Um, and so, I, you know, so I got exposed to that industry and it's, a, it's an interesting group. If anyone who's dealt with the crypto people, and they're usually in their 20s, uh, they're believers. Now I'm really oversimplifying here. They're believers, which is fine, but they don't know very little about how to manage risk you know, in terms of uh, due diligence procedures and all the rest of it. So they, they need to grow up a bit here um, to, to ensure that, you know, that they continue and do the right thing. And so there's a lot of effort, as you, as you all know, with FATF and many others in terms of trying to have you know, international standards regarding the liquidity. So all the, all the prudential aspects that banks have dealt with for decades are, is going to come their way. And so they need to, you know, be, be prepared for that. We talked about environmental crime, a big focus on anti-corruption, uh, both uh, with the G20 uh, and, and many other jurisdictions as well, including law enforcement. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And then the mutual valuation process. I'll, I'll, I'll um, mention that a little bit more and further down. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this that much, that maybe for the sake of time, but this is just to map a little more clearly the connection, the convergence between sustainability and green crime. Right? So um, this kind of brings out you know, the, the stage in terms of the environmental and social factors that are very much intertwined with both of them. Uh, even the, uh, there's a high level group compiled of EU foreign ministers. Um, that's looking into this as well. Uh, and this also comes into potential uh, when you look at subsidies and the Green Deal, and also even the carbon trading market, the voluntary uh, carbon trading market. Um, and then it's more specifically, when you look at the environmental and the social criteria, as I, as I mentioned, right, in terms of you have to look at, you know, the environmental impact and potentially if some as a corporate or an individual is on a, being sanctioned somewhere, somehow, against doing something they shouldn't be doing that has a negative environmental impact or they're dealing with a company that's, you know, that's causing deforestation in some parts of the world. The social, of course, is about equality, fairness, and economic prosperity. And this is where you have specifically the, the sub-criteria, human trafficking, labor rights, and land rights, all data points that, that we as a, as we're finited within the customer third-party risk business um, monitor. And then, um, so last few years, we, uh, we did a few surveys on green crime as a topic. And it's interesting, we asked three questions. Uh, the first is, do you agree that we can't think of green crime the way we term it as just another money laundering issue, but it's, in fact, it's a threat to peace and security. And this is when we're on a lockdown, by the way. So the pandemic reportedly was caused by uh, by, by, by um, wet markets in China. So the whole point about how our, our interactions with the environment is not just a health issue, but it's a security issue. And, and, and again, the, the people that we, or the, the, the companies that we surveyed were across buy side, sell side, corporates, uh, dif different functions. And 81% said, yes, it's not just a, compliance issue, but it's in fact, it's a security issue. Do you think that green crime should receive equal amount of attention as money laundering and terrorism? Overwhelmingly, yes. And this one is interesting. Should the International Criminal Court add equal side, which is the term that people use on this issue, be added to one of the list of international crimes? 
84% said yes. So what started out as a campaign or awareness on our end, we wanted to see, do people agree that this, this should be an issue? And I think that the pandemic and everything that's happened have opened our eyes in terms of, in terms of these issues. So, so I think this is, a, this is something that's gonna be a lot more attention on in terms of what we do from a compliance perspective uh, in terms of how we, how we deal with this issue, not just from an ESG and sustainable finance uh, perspective. Um, very briefly, I mentioned public-private partnerships, and that, so it's a, it's a specific term for a specific type of consortium. And this just shows you, and this is actually a couple of years old now, this slide, uh, because you'll see a lot more blue in Europe, including Sweden, Germany, Holland, many others. Uh, but this gives you a flavor for, for what's out there. So I think this is going to be a big topic in Europe, because this features very prominently within the e EU's AML legislative package. What's the issue? The issue that there isn't a European framework. This, who's going to be responsible for this in Europe? AMLA. This is going to be a big part of their remit. It's coming up with a European framework for how organizations can share information with each other, including how that resolves, resolves data privacy, which is another issue that we need to find a way through. So that would be, so if Frankfurt wants to, wants to host the AMLA, this is the, one of the driving topics because the, everybody wants it. Law enforcement wants it, banks want it, corporates want it, but not everyone is on the same page of that. So there's gonna be a big debate in terms of what does that look like? And there's many different models. I guess that's the point of this. It's not, there's not one size fits all. Yeah, over 40% of global uh, GDP, global GDP, now have some kind of, uh, so Europe is behind as, as the other point here. It's probably 10 years behind in this discussion than the rest of the world. And whether Europe wants to have one or not, the world is moving on. Uh, so this is interesting. I just wanted to share this with you. So this goes back into a conversation we just had with Interpol Lyon a few weeks ago, because you're gonna see their efforts a lot more. You're gonna see their name and, and, and reaching out to the industry in a much different way than they've done in the past. So they have a specific remit from their president and Jürgen Stock, Secretary General, all the way down the leadership to engage with the industry on their priorities. So that you'll probably find them in Frankfurt at some point and in other, in other important places. But they want to maintain and continue to be seen as the world's leading. Uh, uh, cooperative about it. By the way, you probably know Interpol itself is not a law enforcement agency. It's just a cooperative. What they do is they just coordinate all, with all the 195 law enforcement agencies, and then they'll issue these notices, right? Red notices that you see in James Bond. They'll issue a red notice on chairs. It's like, oh, okay. Anytime I go into an airport, then they grab it. So that's what they do. That's a function. But, and they have specific objectives to strengthen its global response and then support members. Uh, and provide glo global leadership. What that means in practice is that they're trying to find ways to collaborate more with key partners to, um, to, to build capacity to their members, some of whom have limited resources, limited capacity. And so they see very much their role as trying to build that capacity and, and they're looking for partners outside of their tent to do, to do so. These are the prime priorities. Fraud and payment crime, not, not unsurprising. Uh, asset recovery, money laundering asset recovery. Uh, asset recovery is a big topic, of course, for SATAF as well. Anti-corruption, and they're gonna spend a lot more time on uh, corruption in sports, believe it or not. Uh, and not just um, types of human trafficking with these players from Sub-Saharan Africa who are used and misused by sport agents and all. It's a very murky world, by the way, when it comes to agents. But also uh, the sports betting market, which is huge. It's about 10% of the EU's GDP. And the influence on uh, the sports betting market to the sports themselves uh, is, a, is an area that they're gonna focus on. And, and we've done a little bit of work with them on that. And then environmental crime, we talked about that. Uh, 
One of the specific areas are looking to collaborate use of data and case management tools. So this is what we're helping them to scope out a bit more on what's available out there. They don't have to build it themselves, but they can partner with, uh, with either us or other companies for that matter, in terms of making sure that they, have, they know what's there. So we're working through, we're doing two um, workshops, one in Singapore, the other headquarters in, in Lyon to understand their use cases, what exactly are they aiming to achieve. So we're working with them on that. I mentioned, uh, I'm going to suggest, which we found incredibly powerful, is to have uh, uh, analyst working groups to being experts that focuses on a particular typology. And you invite uh, the specialists out there in the industry, banking, whichever sector they come from. You put them in a room and so, you know, what are you guys seeing? It's incredibly powerful. Um, and we did that in, in, in South Africa. And the report that I mentioned, that the report that was published last week is a, is a byproduct of that effort. And then do joint publications. So let me see a lot more of them being, being involved in that. Um, I'm not sure how uh, relevant this one is. I'll go through this quite quickly. There's a big focus on the, uh, the uh, FACTAF's mutual evaluation process. Of course, uh, the mutual evaluation process is what brings up gray lists, black lists, and, and, and all the rest of it, right? So, but that, that process is quite murky and how they actually come up with their lists and quite controversial. So we, so the co so we have a working group um, led by uh, Daniel fellows who used to be the chair of MoneyVal, and Rob Wainwright used to be the executive director of Europol. They're leading a working group with FATA to, to reassess the mutual evaluation process. So I'm going to share with you now what, is that, what those recommendations look like. And it's public, by the way. So you can, you can find it uh, and read it on your own time. The first recommendation was that the part of the evaluation process should be much more clear in endorsing PPPs because it's a, it's a powerful mechanism, we think, collectively, a lot of people would agree, that uh, it actually does quite a bit of good in terms of being more effective in how we use our resources because there's a complete disalignment between resources spent and output and we've been working on this regime for at least 30 years, yet we're doing the same thing over and over again and achieving, you know, the, 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 the statistic that everyone brings out, which is a controversial statistic on its own. So despite all the billions and all the efforts of stopping money laundering, the less than 1% actually gets recovered by law enforcement. No one's disputing that number. Well, people are disputing the size, the size of the number, but the main point is clear. So PPPs is a way, information sharing partnership is for us to become much more effective in how we use our resources. And it also is effective in terms of how we help governments with their national risk priorities. Where are the risks? How do we then shift our resources to those risks? So at the moment, you know, everyone's kind of doing the wrong thing. So that, that should be much more clear in their methodology in terms of endorsing that, those, those types of frameworks. Information sharing and data privacy, big topic. We've been on the forefront of that topic of raising awareness of that issue. What's the issue? The issue is that, uh, and I'll talk a little bit, I think I have a few slides on that, is that there is a information sharing and the financial crime world tries to promote collaboration. Data privacy inhibits it. So issues like right to be forgotten, ex explicit consent, they become, they become a bit of an issue because uh, if you have someone who decides to get themselves a golden visa from wherever part of the world, they can then call the banks up and they'll say, I want you, all that information, how about I want to delete it? Right to be forgotten, which is a, which is a regulation and part is a fundamental human right, by the way, which is an EU charter. Financial crime is not. That's why the EU's AML legislative package is going to the R, the regulation and not a directive. So the issue around those, those things, and there are, there are good arguments on both sides, by the way. I'm not putting that, I'm just saying in the context of financial crime, it has unintended consequences that criminals will exploit, for sure. They're doing that already. 
So Patak needs to take that up. It can only be solved here. We can't solve it as a company. EU can, it's, it's not just an EU, well, it's an EU issue in the sense of GDPR, but that's, that's being reverberated around the world. And the, the, the European Court of Justice um, ruling is a, an example of that. Um, and it was based on, on the data privacy uh, piece. Uh, yeah, strength, same theme, but strength, it should be a specific section on, uh, on promoting collaboration between key stakeholders, wherever they may be, to inform national risk priorities. So that way, it, you know, we align our resources uh, in a more strategic way than we're currently doing. The usefulness of information needs to be considered. So this is SARS, so it's just, uh, suspicious uh, transaction reporting, STRs. Because at the moment, banks, as you probably know, are what they call doing defensive reporting, right? They're just opening the floodgates. Here, take it. FIUs are like, I don't know what to do with that. So we need to look at what exactly information do we need? And how do we find a, a, a feedback mechanism so that we can recalibrate what's needed and when and by whom? Um, and then I'll skip through some of these. Uh, yeah, this is low value. You know, are, are there things that we can do to reprioritize where we spend our time? Basically, is what that is. Uh, as I say, similar. Yeah, it's it's a guidance around how we implement a national risk priorities. Um, and then this one is another pet peeve of mine that we need to come up with minimum data standards. Uh, this sounds boring, but it's fundamental. The public registry is an example. We need a, a, a minimum data standards on what's actually in them. Because only then, globally, by the way, because only then can you start comparing. And that also includes sanctions. There's 65 sanctions authorities, all with their different naming conventions, which causes havoc. So my name can be spelled 65 different ways. And then I have acronyms as well. And that causes an immense amount of confusion and financial exclusion, by the way, because a lot of parts of the world share similar last name. So this minimum data piece is fundamental in terms of increasing effectiveness and also then using uh, technology because data stand, uh, similar data standards is a prerequisite to using automation. So this for me is, is like, this is a big topic of mine, particularly the European uh, Commission. Uh, right, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to bore you with the package itself. Maybe just a few things to highlight. Um, so Europe is going to come on with their own blacklist. In fact, uh, there's a European country that's well, not on the blacklist, but on the grey list, Gibraltar, and the UAE. It's not a European country, but the other country that's been added to it. But there's going to be a lot of discussion. Of, okay, what's the, what does their methodology look like, and who's in and who's out? Because this by the way, it's not just a technical issue, it's a political issue. Because I know that European Parliament have asked me, Che, what do you think about our list? <laughs> I don't want to comment why this country is in and why that country is out, right? So there's going to be a lot of focus on this. And, and the European Commission, of course, is going to put a lot of emphasis because they themselves want to in, enforce and impose, which they have every right to, uh, on, on who they think the good actors or bad actors are. Customer due diligence, uh, while this is nothing new, I only bring this out because this is gonna be enforced in a big way, not AML package related, but in the supply chain package that's related in terms of the requirements for corporates. Um, and it's gonna come out, it's gonna be copy and pasted from, from, from the articles one to 24. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get back to data protection in a moment. Policy and procedures, training, nothing new there really, but if you wanna know what's new, then here are the articles, 45 and 46. Sanctions, I'll talk about that in a minute. EU national risk, uh, uh, EU national risk assessments. This is where the previous discussion around how we can actually find common working groups or some kind of platform for the public and the private sector to get together and say, what are the risks? Because AMLA's not gonna know. The public sector by definition relies on the private sector to be its eyes and ears. So how do we then find a mechanism for us to tell public officials what the risks actually are for what we're seeing? 
And that, and that includes us as a company, right? We, we, we kind of see what's going on in the world. Beneficial ownership information, fantastic. We've been calling for reforms in this area for a very long time. It's great that it's there. More work needs to be done. Some of the issues around how do we ensure data quality? How do we ensure, well, who has access to it? Who's going to pay for it? It's still up for debate. Uh, and, we're, and we're great to see that the EU really wants to, the European Commission really wants Europe to have more of a, a presence nationally and internationally, which we applaud. Because these things, as we all know, this is not a national issue, it's a global issue. So that's all good. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with this. Very busy. <laughs> What's going on in this in terms of the legislative package? Right, so let me deep deep a little more into the data privacy and versus the AML. Now, let me say I'm for data privacy. There's nothing data privacy at all, but there is a there is an issue that we need to resolve. And I'll point to what they are fundamentally. This came up regarding um, so crypto. So there's an article in Bloomberg on the 21st of June last year, of course, uh, regarding you know fraud within the in the crypto space. And, uh, uh, and there was a, one of the commentator, one of the social media responses as well. Yeah, the US is gonna be, but basically the US is gonna be quite heavy on this, but actually, if you really wanted to you know, have fun, then go to Europe, right? That's, 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 the, that's the building perception. So what does that mean in practice? Is that, um, so these are the principles at play here. We talk about data pooling, we talk about information sharing, we talk about network mapping, or we didn't talk about network mapping, but a big part of what we do is be able to map, especially when it comes to public registries, who owns what where. So the shell company, which is majority owned by another one in Iceland, that's owned somewhere in Germany, da, 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 right? They're designed to obfuscate. So we tried to, to unpack that. So that's what AML, and there's a call for companies who want more of that. They want to be able, really, and especially when it comes with sanctions, right? That's really where the risk is, because now you're required to do that on a much uh, different level. And I'll give you examples of that, but, but that's important, right? People want more network analysis. Joint typology development, we talked about PPPs, more effective case management, more effective monitoring. So those are the, the, under, the principles in which the, the financial crime AML packages are trying to get to. Data privacy, uh, and this is, is going the other way. And this is not me speaking, this is from the uh, Data Privacy Authority's paper that they published last year to respond to some of these provisions. Uh, they want to avoid data processing, they want to separate data processing. So they want to create more pool, you know, different lakes and not, uh, not combine the lake. They want to limit the detail on the data, what they call abstraction. They want to make data incomprehensible. And they want to break the link between events, companies, and the data itself. So these are the principles of play. They're, 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 they're fundamental issues. So uh, I guess our point has always been, let us get together and understand, you know, where do we play? Because that, that's not helpful. Uh, and I have to say, on the, that's on the one hand. On the other hand, we're also uh, pleased that the, the data privacy authorities are, they're, they're getting closer, but so, there needs to be a platform. Someone needs to kind of hold the gavel and bring the parties together. How do we? Get around this because at the moment there is fundamental issues um, at play. So companies, in effect, have to make a decision. In principle, do they meet the uh, uh, AML obligations, or do they delete their data? And God forbid, if some that person and requested for the data to be deleted turns out to be on a sanctions list. That's a place you don't want to be. 
So, you know, so these are, these are real. And uh, so I think the, the good news is that the, the, these issues are now recognized or on the table, they're being discussed. I don't know where we're going to end up, but at least they're there because this took us a few years as a company to highlight uh, that we need to, we need to get to this. Now let's talk about sanctions. You can't do a presentation on AML without talking sanctions. Uh, this, this current situation, in my view, is here to stay for the foreseeable future. If you just compare historical sanctions, they usually last around a quarter of a century. So uh, this is a very crude thing that I did based on, uh, based on a database that looked at the global sanctions since the 1950s. Uh, and what you see here, these are the different sanctions programs by country against the country. And these are the years that those sanctions have been in place. And they can last about 69 years. That's, that's, that's what these things are. It's just the, the length of those sanctions. And, and it has nothing to indicate to me that the current situation is going to change in the near future. That's the starting off point. But it gets worse in terms of the complexity of it. Uh, <clears throat> I mentioned there's 65 sanctions authorities with hundreds of lists. Yeah, you probably know that the European Union are going to build up. They're putting a lot. This is a big priority in terms of the, the uh, Europe creating its own sanctions enforcement, which is going to mean basically they want to create a FinCEN. Big focus, which is fine. Uh, but the, the, the idea, the complexity around how to manage these lists needs to be addressed for the reasons that I mentioned before. There needs to be a common methodology in terms of when you put it off, whoever it is, that, that at least there's comparability that I can you know, chase a day and it's okay, I know who that is. Versus if I share a last name where it's quite common. Uh, <clears throat> this is based on our data uh, from our researchers who do absolutely amazing amount of work in this area. So what you have here is last year's sanctions activity. Uh, the, the ones in blue are new added sanctions, and the ones in orange are the ones that have been amended. So I was on the original, but my wife is now added or you know something like that. And what you'll see and a lot of people think that the U.S. has been the most active. No, it's the EU has been the most active. And I don't think that's going to change. Um, in fact, it's, it's, we've seen, the, in fact, I think last week they released their 10th sanctions package. Um, and and what will, if we compare them, so the, the different sanctions authorities on the top, types of sanctions on the side, and what this shows, it's not very easy to read, but what, what this, the thrust of this is that this is not, the sanctions is not targeted towards individuals. It's towards the entire Russian economy, which means that if you're a bank or a corporate exposed or your counterparty may have some exposure, that's being cut. There's a fundamental cut between the West and Russia. Uh, on this, and there's nothing to suggest to me that that's going to change. So this is a for corporates. This is a you know a big big exposure. The other piece that I mentioned. Um, uh, so there's a there's a when people talk sanctions, they think it's like for like. It's not. So what's different? Partly what's different. So explicit sanctions are very much around a particular name. Very easy. The screen against that name. Yes. No. But 95% of these are implicit sanctions, which means that it's not just a name, but exposure to any type of entity, the oil and, the oil and gas sector, not just an individual. And that's incredibly complicated. I'm being told I'm running out of time, but the point is that this is different than, than historically what it's been. I'll stop there. There's more that we could have done. Well, maybe just this one. I'll, I'll, there's an industry challenge piece, which you can read on your own. Sanctions evasion is going to become an EU crime as well. Um, and, and there's going to be a lot of focus on recovery and, and some confiscation, but that one is a, that's a big one. I'll stop there. Okay. <laughs>
Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Tay, for, for taking and us on this uh, like overwhelming tour through the institutions and operations, regulations, and uh, activities uh, that we see in anti-money laundering um, area. So it's it's quite impressive, and I, I know that there could we could start the debate on the sanctions actually because the effectiveness of the sanctions is something that is in discussion in Germany. Just recently, we had a report uh, by the EBRD uh, on how global trade has developed, and you somehow have the impression that things that had gone to Russia directly in the past are now going through other Baltic states or whatever. So, but this needs a more closer insight, obviously. Um, I, I think we have a few minutes left, so I would uh, like to open the discussion and see, first of all, while I'm checking for the Q&A section here, uh, whether there are already some questions coming from the audience. So please be free to, to ask, and maybe we should repeat the question just for mic microphone sure. purposes. I can say, yeah, please. Yeah, Hi, thanks, uh, Jay. Great presentation. Um, Richard Nicholson from Acme. Um, you were mentioning at one point that the banks provide lots of data to the authorities <clears throat> about possible worries about um, financial crime. And then the authorities have so much information, what are they going to do? Um, are there any developments in you know, AI technologies which are helping sort through this, this data? And if so, is it the public sector that's developing them or is it the, is it the private sector? Yeah, no, no, thank you for the question. The question was about um, uh, you know, or, or who's, who's doing a thing about using technology to, to, to make the use of big data more, more effective, if that, that's the way to, to kind of... Uh, so there are some countries who are who are exploring this. So ne the Netherlands, they have a, a joint a partnership uh, on, on transaction monitoring tool that they're developing. Um, uh, then Deloitte and the banks are involved, including the FIU. Uh, so they're so they're doing something uh, in that space. There are other countries who are trying to develop uh, or create a kind of a utility uh, in terms of having a common standard that is then sent and provided to a utility, meaning that. Banks will provide information to the to this entity. That entity will then provide that to to the financial intelligence units to, to make sure there's certain standards and and the data is, the data quality is better. But no one's cracked that yet. Um, and I think there's a lot more that we have to do in terms of um, showing the output that actually works, so we can actually identify a particular case that's being used. And we also, in the public uh, sector, have the resources. Uh, to be able to to be able to sift that through as well, because they sit on a lot of stuff, but they can't really action it. They don't act. The law enforcement doesn't action it. They, that means that the prosecution doesn't action it, right? So there's, there's it's not just banks to FIUs. It's then FIUs need to do something. They need to analyze it, provide it to the prosecutor's office. They open up. You know what I mean? Like it's a whole, it's a whole. So I think there's a lot more there that we need to do to connect the dots. Any other questions here from the audience? In the room. Well, there is a question um, about you know everybody's talking about uh, ChatGPT now. So artificial intelligence is more in the focus than ever. And um, in, in former times, it was often the discussion that um, also animanti, animani laundering could um, profit from the development of artificial intelligence. On the other hand, uh, you showed us the problem of data protection. And um, so, and, and usually artificial intelligence needs a lot of data, you know, to be efficient. So what is, what is your um, view on beyond this, on yeah. the use of artificial intelligence? So I'll share what we, how we use it. Uh, so there's a, so the, the, one of the issues that we deal with and that our, that our, the industry deals with is the explosion of unstructured data. So it's basically information that's out there in the public domain. So uh, Rene, a police officer, arrests Chase Sedanius on the suspicion of X, Y, and Z. That's unstructured. So what we do is we use uh, natural language processing and AI to structure it. So we will then say, okay, you don't care about Rene, but you do care about Chase. You do care about that, that particular um, typology or, or risk identification. And that's what we want to do. So that way... Analysts, because it can be very manual, right? So analysts don't have to read through it, but we have a machine that does it for them and covering 65 languages as well. 
So that's how we do it. Mm -hmm. But then you get into the human aspect, which is that the, my, my own view that artificial intelligence shouldn't replace judgment that's then being made, because then you can get into very dangerous territory, in my view. Mm -hmm. And that's what chat um, bought and all the rest of them. Uh, you know, you, have, you really have to pay attention to things like biases uh, to make sure that you don't come with a, you know, an outcome that, 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 that shouldn't. But that's how, that's how we use it. That's the problem that we're trying to solve for. Mm -hmm. And that's going back to your point, what can be used for, SAR, for STR, suspicious transaction report. Mm -hmm. Let's come up with a data standard, which is a prerequisite to then being able to use artificial intelligence to, to actually pinpoint potential typologies or, 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 or certain trends. Uh, so that's, that's, that would be my answer to how we use it. Thank you. Um, yeah, time is almost up. Maybe one more last question because I started off with a little bit of advertising um, for the financial center. And I, of course, I would like to give you the opportunity. So what is Refinitiv doing for uh, companies, you know, in terms of I mean, money laundering support? Yeah, so we, um, so, so what we do in effect, so we are a risk intelligence data provider that provides information to companies for them to be able to understand the types of risks that they may be exposed to, either through the supply chain, the counterparties, um, uh, to, to ensure that they have a, you know, a risk a, a picture in terms of you know, where they do business. And that expands not just with money laundry, but 64 other risk categories um, um, uh, that, that expands human trafficking and, and a lot of other things that we've talked about. So that's what we do, not just for the banks, but for law enforcement and the corporate sector. Thank you for this. Uh, final words. Um, what, I, what I'm taking home is the sentence that you said, it's not about compliance, it's a human issue. And this is really um, a good summarize of, of today's, um, today's information that we have gathered. Thank you very much for, for being here. Thank you for having us, actually. Uh, was pleasure to have this uh, this speech today. Thank you everybody here in the room and also the audience uh, online. So I hope we'll meet again uh, soon um, and we are going to stick with hybrid events. I see that there are almost as many people joining online as we started off with, which makes me quite happy. So uh, technique obviously worked um, and we had no dropouts. So, and there is the rest of the buffet here. And sorry, if there was a background noise, this was a coffee machine. So I can only encourage people who are now in the home office. Next time we'll invite, uh, join us, join us for a lively breakfast. Thank you, Revinitiv. Thank you for being here. Have a nice time. Have a good week. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Thank you.